Vladimir Jutsi. We are watching all the news happening in the United States and around the world. If we see it, look at these speeds coming into us into the CBS News Broadcast Center. If we see it there, you'll see it right here. This is CBS News 24-7. involuntary manslaughter trial begins in New Mexico. We look at the arguments both sides are making as the jury begins to hear opening statements. Blistering heat from coast to coast, and it's a one-two punch for millions in Texas who are suffering from the aftermath of Hurricane Barrel, how residents there are battling the temperatures and the power outages. Plus, take a look at this. Two passenger jets flying dangerously close to each other, and they appear to be on a collision course. What we know about what happened. Let's begin this morning in New Mexico. Opening statements are expected to begin in just a few moments in Alec Baldwin's involuntary manslaughter trial. Now, Baldwin was holding a prop gun that went off, killing cinematographer Helena Hutchins. That happened on the set of the movie Russ back in 2021. Our Elise Preston is at the courthouse in Santa Fe, New Mexico. All right, Elise, uh, what can we expect this morning? Good morning, Vlad. Well, opening statements are uh, set to get started in about a half hour. I can tell you within the last uh, 30 seconds, Mr. Baldwin just walked into the courtroom. A lot of media out here today, not as much public uh, as you would think. And we also just saw his family walk inside. He is here uh, with his wife. Ilaria. Now, today, opening statements, we will hear both from the prosecution and defense as they lay out their cases. The prosecution is expected to lay out the groundwork that Mr. Baldwin acted with negligence, that he was reckless on set with guns. Now, they are only allowed to present him in court as an actor, not as a producer of this safety riddled uh, set. So we will only hear about his actions uh, in that moment where that prop gun fired. Meanwhile, the defense is supposed to lay a very different groundwork. Yesterday during during jury selection, they asked jurors that they had the ability to question investigators, to question even prosecutors and, and question uh, this whole entire process. So we are going to hear from the prosecution that they are going to poke a lot of holes in this case. Again, jury selection was yesterday. 16 people were picked, 12 jurors, four alternates, uh, and 11 of them are women, five are men. All of those people are inside, and they will hear those opening statements today. The trial is expected to, to last through next Friday, Vlad. All right, Elise Preston in Santa Fe, New Mexico for us this morning. Elise, thanks very much. We'll check in with you a bit later. You can watch Gavel to Gavel coverage of the trial on the Inside Edition stream. You can find that at insideedition.com forward slash live. All right, turning now to the high temperatures that are battering Americans from coast to coast. Millions of people are under excessive heat warnings and heat advisories as temperatures linger in the triple digits in some areas. Let's go to CBS News correspondent Carter Evans, who's joining me now from the California coast. So, Carter, how are residents there dealing with the heat? Yes. You were in Vegas yesterday. You're back home on home turf, but it's still hot. It's still hot, and, and it's still hot in many parts of Los Angeles, although much cooler than Las Vegas, which has been breaking records for the last few days. Triple digits, uh, and they broke an all-time record, 120 degrees. Now, you're getting triple digit temperatures in the inland areas of Southern California. Uh, the problem is, a lot of people want to come to the coast to cool off, and it's going to be in the 80s here today. That's great. And you can get in the water right here. You can see surfers behind me. But further down the beach towards Santa Monica, the water is off limits right now because it's filled with bacteria that comes from runoff from the streams. And that's the case for many beaches all the way down to San Diego. So people coming down to the coast to beat the heat today may not be able to get into the water. Uh, Carter, you also spoke to some residents in Oregon. Uh, how are people in the Pacific Northwest dealing with the temperatures? Well, this is the thing. If you look at a heat map here and you look at it, it extends all the way north up to Canada. So they're experiencing triple digit temperatures in Portland. And, and that's not entirely uncommon. But what is uncommon is how high these temperatures are and how long they're lasting. 
We're talking about triple-digit temperatures for five days or more. And in a town like Portland, Oregon, you've got a lot of old buildings there that do not have air conditioning. So people there are not set up for this. Um, basically, what we've got now are, are cooling centers around the area of Portland. They've set up tents with misters so people that live in those apartment buildings can come outside, get under one of these tents and, and cool off. And then uh, we, we met a gentleman who, who needed a fan. He didn't have any air conditioning. He said it was triple digits outside and it wasn't much cooler in his apartment. And, and he got some help from an organization that normally puts food on his table, meals on wheels, not delivering food, but delivering fans in Portland. We get a lot of fan requests, so we just have people calling in and we have a list. First fan is donated. You know, we just give it to the first people who have called. So if you have a spare fan at home or you can afford to buy a couple, please reach out to your local Meals on Wheels location and donate it to us. Just gives you an idea of how desperate people are to keep cool right now. Uh, you know, I mean, imagine if your only option to cool off was to ask a volunteer to bring you a fan. You got triple digits inside of your apartment. Vlad, it's really tough for a lot of people right now. I can imagine. Uh, and speaking of how to stay cool, Carter, I know you're just dying to put on your wetsuit and get on your surfboard, but, I mean, you talked about the runoff in the ocean. You get, I mean, what are you thinking? Well, you know, I mean, there are a lot of places you really just can't go in the ocean right now because it is just too dirty. And we're talking about, like, dangerous, dangerous bacteria, the kind that can give you staph infections and things like that. So you really don't want to get in this water. Another kind of uh, bacteria or algae that we've been seeing in the water here, and this is due to the warmer water temperatures, is we're seeing a lot of these red tides around right now. And that is impacting a lot of the sea life as well. So the heat, uh, not just the air, but also the ocean as well. All right, Carter Evans for us in L.A. Carter, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Let us bring in CBS News Philadelphia meteorologist Tammy Sousa with a look at the national forecast. Hey, Tammy. Well, hey, Vlad. This heat is not going anywhere. It is going to be with us, it looks like, for at least another week or so. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of those uh, temperatures that we are expecting. Uh, we just heard Carter Evans talk about what's going on, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Look at this. We are expecting to have temperatures that could be in the triple digits. Look at Sacramento, 108. Of course, we're looking at Palm Springs at 120. But when you get up here, Billings, Montana, 108 degrees. That's without a heat index. Now, let's go to the East Coast, where we are equally as hot. Doesn't look like it because we have temperatures in the 90s. But we do have excessive heat warnings and heat advisories. And with all of the humidity, that is going to feel like 105 to 110 degrees. So dangerous heat on both coasts. Now, that big heat bubble that you see on the West Coast, that is slowly going to be moving across the country over the next five days, hitting the plains, the deep south, and then finally the east coast by the time we get into Monday and Tuesday. And guess what? Up and down the eastern seaboard, we could be challenging 100 degrees by the time that we get into Tuesday. Staying cool is going to be the biggest thing, the most important thing. Here's one of my tips. Hey, take a cool shower, throw some clothes in the freezer, wait 30 minutes, take them out, put them on, instant refreshment. We'll talk more about this and the remnants of Burl when I come back in a few minutes. Vlad? All right, Tammy, I'm going to try that, uh, and I'll report back to you tomorrow. All right? I hope it works. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tammy. All right, President Biden and former President Trump continue the march to November. Uh, the president is in the midst of hosting a three-day NATO summit event while continuing to combat concerns about whether or not he is fit to serve another four years. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump made his first appearance in nearly two weeks at a campaign rally at his golf resort in the suburbs of Miami. Our Nancy Cordes is tracking all the details with the White House. Nancy, uh, Trump challenged Biden to another debate this week, and he also challenged him to a round of golf. Uh, but importantly, walk us through what was said and how President Biden is responding to those challenges. Right. Well, the uh, Biden campaign had some uh, fun with those challenges. They rejected them. They used a lot of golf metaphors um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and basically said uh, they're too busy running the country to deal with, uh, with, with frivolous suggestions like a, a golf tournament. But, um, you know, more broadly, this White House continues to deal with uh, challenges closer to home and the fact that uh, every day 
brings a, a, a new Democratic defection, new Democratic concerns being voiced. Just this morning, you had the former House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, very influential in the party, seeming to suggest that President Biden uh, hasn't made up his mind yet, and he still has time to change it. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, this White House is trying to deal with the challenges as they arise and knock them down, uh, but then new things come up. And the question is, is, you know, is this something that they are going to have to be dealing with all the way from now until Election Day, if he stays in the race? So speaking of those constituents uh, and whether or not they're going to stick with the president, he's going to meet today with top labor union leaders of the AFL-CIO, which represents uh, 60 unions. So what are we expecting to come out of that meeting? Uh, and what are you hearing broadly from the Biden camp about union support? Right. Well, you've heard Democrats say so often they want to see the president out there. They want to hear from him. They want reassurance. And so this is uh, another stop on his reassurance tour. He's meeting with union leaders. This is a national, uh, a natural base of support for the president. He likes to t uh, talk about the fact that he's uh, one of the most or the most pro-union president ever. Uh, and so that's a friendly room that he's going into. Last night, he called into a, a, a meeting of Democratic mayors to try to reassure them. So he's putting himself out there. There are still groups of lawmakers who would like to see him in person or at least have a call with him as well. He's been making some one-on-one -on -one calls, but there, are, uh, but there are groups on the Hill that are, are still feeling unsettled. They'd like to hear from him as well. There's only so many calls he can make because, after all, he's also hosting a three-day international summit here in Washington, D.C. gave a big speech last night at the NATO summit. He is meeting with world leaders today and then, of course, holding that big press conference, high stakes press conference tomorrow. Right. So speaking of that press conference, uh, Nancy, which is scheduled to happen uh, tomorrow, uh, I want you to talk about a couple of things. The Biden camp says they actually have done interviews with the press because the narrative has been that he has done fewer interviews than his predecessors, yeah. both Donald Trump and President Obama, which is true. The Biden people say that they do interviews with non-traditional uh, media. In other words, not the White House press score. Uh, press court. What do you think about that? And how long is that press conference tomorrow going to last? Because that is what people are going to be watching for. How long he's able to stand, basically in the heat of the kitchen, to take those questions from all of you. I think there's no question that this president has done fewer interviews with traditional reporters who cover the White House, who know these issues backwards and forwards uh, than his predecessors did. Um, and, and we're talking about print interviews, television interviews, long interviews. Even the, the, the interview with George Stephanopoulos on Friday was only about 20 minutes. Um, and on top of that, has done fewer solo press conferences as well. Uh, the last big domestic press conference he held was seven or eight months ago. Um, and there's only been a handful of them, uh, fewer th than five, I think. And, you know, the White House likes to say, well, he does talk to you in more informal settings. Yes, when we are shouting questions at him uh, and he has the opportunity to pick and choose which one he wants to answer, sure, there are those moments. Sure, he has held uh, more truncated press conferences, uh, known as two and twos, where he's with another world leader and they each take two questions or questions from two reporters from their home country. Countries. Um, but, but that's a lot different from a, a, a wide-ranging press conference where you take questions from 10 different reporters in a, in a venue uh, where the, the back and forth can go on for an hour or more. And so uh, that's why tomorrow's press conference will be so uh, heavily scrutinized, because uh, Democratic leaders and the rank and file just haven't seen him in that setting in quite some time. Indeed, and it will be a very interesting press conference. I'm uh, sort of thinking that this is the one where a lot of people are going to be looking, and if that drumbeat that you were talking about earlier uh, continues, they will take their cues from what we see tomorrow. Nancy Cordes, thank you very much, as always. You're welcome. All right, meanwhile, another Democratic leader facing his own political uncertainty. I'm talking about New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez. His bribery trial is nearing an end, and it will send his fate to a jury. We're going to have the very latest from the courtroom. Streaming CBS News 24 7. Folks, you are looking at pictures from just moments ago. That is actor Alec Baldwin arriving at a New Mexico courthouse for the start of the involuntary manslaughter trial opening. 
Statements are uh, set to begin in just a few minutes. There you see Mr. Baldwin walking into the courtroom, the throng of reporters there seeking to get a comment. Uh, no comment from Alec Baldwin over the last couple of days. Our correspondent, Elise Preston, is on the ground. She has also been trying to get a comment from Mr. Baldwin. You probably might see her there in that scrum of reporters. We're going to check in with her a little bit later. There you see attorney Gloria Allred, uh, who represents the plaintiffs here. She's making some statements. We're not going to bring that to you, but if we do get anything from the Baldwin camp or from those opening statements, you're going to find it right here. CBS News 24-7. Okay, let's get to some other news now across the pond. Breaking news, British police are currently searching for a triple murder suspect believed to be armed with a crossbow. It comes after three women were found dead inside a house in Bushy. That is northwest of London. That happened yesterday evening. Police say 26-year-old Kyle Clifford may still be armed, and they warned the public not to approach him. The three victims, ages 25, 28, and 61, were identified as Carol Hunt. She is the wife of the BBC racing radio commentator John Hunt and two of their daughters. Incredibly sad, incredibly tragic. Police did not say whether Clifford was connected to the victims, but they are considering this a targeted attack. Listen. We have extensive police resources deployed to various locations in North London and also the bushy area of Hertfordshire. The manhunt also involves armed police officers and specialist search teams responding at pace in the wake of what has been an horrific incident involving what is currently believed to be a crossbow, but other weapons may also have been used. All right, a lot of questions there. In using a crossbow to target uh, three individuals, we're gonna stay on top of that story uh, overseas. But meanwhile, we're following another big story right here in the tri-state area, closing arguments in the federal corruption trial of Senator Bob Menendez. The New Jersey lawmaker is accused of trading in political favors for gold bars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and even a luxury car. And he's facing charges, including bribery and extortion. He has pleaded not guilty on all charges. Elijah Westbrook from CBS New York is outside the courthouse in Manhattan. Elijah, tell us what we don't know so far. Well, Vlad, good morning. Great to be with you. I can tell you that we heard briefly from Senator uh, Bob Menendez, in fact, right outside the courthouse here in Lower Manhattan. I would say this was about an hour ago at this point. Uh, he walked inside. Uh, he spoke to our cameras very briefly, saying that uh, pretty much he feels that the government is putting out a false narrative uh, about him. This is all coming, as you mentioned, that closing arguments are expected to resume as we speak. Uh, the goal here, essentially, is to wrap them up by this morning so that the jury can then, can then go ahead and deliberate. Uh, we know Adam Fee. You probably heard that name before. He is one of the lawyers for Menendez. Uh, he urged jurors uh, just yesterday to acquit Menendez of all charges, uh, adding that prosecutors had failed to prove their case. Uh, he said in his statements yesterday that there were just too many gaps in the evidence and that essentially prosecutors painted this false story, if you will, of a bribery uh, scheme. Now, one thing I do want to mention to you, Vlad, is that Menendez's lawyer told the judge in court yesterday that his closing remarks would last about five hours. Again, we only heard about half of those closing remarks just yesterday. So at this point, we're looking at about another additional two and a half hours of closing remarks. Um, this is all coming as uh, we're being told that the defense attorneys will then have to provide their statements and then there could be some sort of uh, uh, rebuttal uh, argument there from the prosecutor's side. So again, Vlad, this is all taking place as we speak on this very hot day in New York City inside the federal courthouse here in Lower Manhattan. Let's go ahead and send it on back to you. All right, CBS News is Elijah Westbrook with some details that you may not have read about right here. You're finding it on CBS News 24-7. Elijah, we appreciate you, brother. Thank you. War leaders are gathered in Washington for a NATO summit as heads of state from Europe and North America plan to shore up the transatlantic support for Ukraine and its war effort against Russia. So let us bring in CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazis, who joins me now from the State Department in D.C. Olivia, what progress do world leaders hope to make on the situation in Ukraine? Uh, and what's at stake for the president? There's been a lot of pushback from Republicans here in the United States in both the Senate and in the Congress over funding for Ukraine. Tell us what the stakes are. Absolutely, Vlad. It's great to be with you. Good morning. Well, we actually just heard moments ago from Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who announced that F-16 fighter jets are finally <coughs> on their way to Ukraine. They're being sourced from Denmark and the Netherlands. And he said they're expected to be flying in Ukraine skies later this summer. 
That's, of course, in addition to this more robust package of air defense capabilities that President Biden announced last night. That crucially includes those Patriot battery systems uh, that President Zelensky has been appealing for for months as Russian missile attacks have been unrelenting across the country. Uh, Secretary Blinken also laid out additional elements of the overall package that Ukraine can ultimately expect to receive coming out of this summit. He noted that there would be a dedicated NATO liaison officer now stationed in Kyiv and said that Ukraine's eventual membership path would be a, quote, strong, robust, well-lit bridge. Now, we know that that membership is not currently on the table, and we haven't yet seen the full communique that the alliance uh, is working on. Members are still hashing out that language uh, to be finalized in the coming days of this summit, which, as you have noted, is high stakes not only for the Ukrainians and for the alliance writ large, but personally for President Biden. He himself said in a recent interview he challenged the world to come watch, look at this performance as compared to his performance in the debate several weeks ago. Uh, thus far, his public appearances have been steady, but the real test, as you were discussing earlier with Nancy, will be the solo press availability that he's expected to hold tomorrow, uh, where he will take some unsp unscripted questions on what he's done and how he's done throughout the course of this week. All right. Olivia Gazas for us at the State Department. Uh, Olivia, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thick black smoke billowing from a massive fire at a factory in Australia. Well, we know about the explosion that sparked the blaze. You're streaming CBS News 24-7. A shooting took place near Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor's home in Washington, D.C. Police say an 18-year-old walked up to one of their cars, pulled out a gun in an apparent carjacking attempt. A deputy fired at the suspect from inside the vehicle, and he sustained non-life-threatening injuries. There's no indication that Sotomayor was a target. It's a clear case of messing around and finding out. Uh, all right, BMW is recalling nearly 400,000 cars over concerns that the airbag could potentially explode. That's according to the U.S. National Highway Safety Administration. The faulty airbags have been attributed to more than 30 deaths and hundreds of injuries in cars of various automakers. The latest recall includes some BMW sedans and sports wagon models. Hundreds of firefighters are rushing to put out a massive blaze at a factory in Melbourne, Australia. Authorities say a chemical explosion sparked the fire and warn it could take days to contain the flames. Let us bring in CBS News Philadelphia meteorologist Tammy Souza with more on the national forecast. Tammy. Oh, boy. You know what? That heat is unrelenting. And, of course, we're having that severe weather because of the remnants of Beryl. Uh, let's talk about what's going on across our fair nation. We do have coast-to-coast uh, -coast issues that are taking place. In fact... Our biggest concern is going to be right now the West Coast. Now, the West Coast has uh, the most heat that is going on out there, and we are going to be uh, looking at perhaps more records that are going to be broken. So as we go across the country, we'll have problems on the East Coast. You've got the problems in the Midwest, and then you have got that extreme heat that is on the West Coast, and that's all going to be shifting off to the East. So we're going to be watching this go on for the next week, possibly even two weeks. Let's take a look at what's going on with those numbers. Uh, right now, we are expecting highs that are going to be in the triple digits across much of the area. If you're close to the coast, yeah, maybe a little bit of relief, but we are talking about places like Billings coming in at 100 degrees. That's Billings, Montana, 120 in Palm Springs and places like uh, Sacramento coming in at the triple digits, Las Vegas, 118. So a stifling day. Now we shift our attention to the East Coast and we are looking at a feels like heat index that could be 105 to 110. The temperatures in the 90s, but it is that feels like that is really going to get you out there. Bad news if you're looking for any relief, because through next week, where you see all of this red, that is all expected to be well above average. You look up at the little timeline at the top, no blue. If you see blue, that's good, because you might be below average temperature-wise. The only place in the United States that has that 
is Alaska. So they are going to be slightly below average. Uh, let's talk about what's going to go on uh, with the barrel. Now, barrel, the remnants uh, moving through the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes right now. Still a lot of spin to this, still a lot of concern about severe weather taking place. As it moves into the Northeast, that severe weather is going to turn into a threat for damaging winds flooding rains that could create some flash flooding and isolated tornadoes, especially up into New York State, central and north New York. And we also have a flash flood concern. So this stretches from Philadelphia, even from Roanoke, all the way up into the northeast. And that is the big concern that we're going to be looking for flash flooding taking place there. Vlad, I'm going to send it back to you. All right, Tammy, thank you as always. Appreciate it. The FAA is investigating after two passenger planes appear to fly close to each other over Syracuse, New York. Check this out. This is police dash cam video. You can see it's a Delta Connection flight that was taking off while an American Airlines flight was about to land. To the eye, it appeared as both were about to collide. Luckily, they did not. The FAA has not yet classified the incident as a close call. Guys in the studio, does it feel to you like it's getting... I mean, I know flying is the safest form of travel, but every day, yeah, I, don't like it. I don't like it either. I don't like it either. Uh, scary, scary, scary moments. All right, uh, let's talk about California now, where giant barges are being used to capture the polluting diesel exhaust from container ships and other large vessels that run their engines while berthed at the Oakland port. CBS Oakland's Ite Hode has more on the company behind the idea. <laughs> More than two decades, Mike Walker worked his way to the top of the tech world, earning a mid-six-figure salary as the CEO of several successful startups. How deep are the spuds right now? But even though he was living the dream, something was missing. It's super important to find the reason why you want to do something. His latest venture, Stax, might just be the holy grail of business, making money out of thin air while also saving the planet. For the last couple of years, Mike and his team have been on a mission against emissions. His company builds green barges like this one that essentially serve as giant vacuum cleaners, capturing exhausts from container ships while they're berthed at port. This is our boom. It's 245 feet. It extends itself up and over the vessel where a long elephant-like trunk comes down and we put that over the top of the stack and that's where the emissions are gathered. A 2020 study done in Spain showed 265,000 premature deaths were attributed to global shipping emissions. State regulations require vessels to plug into an electrical grid known as shore power, which allows ships to turn off their engines while at berth. But that's not always possible. Usually, any given year, we see around over 8,000 vessel visits. Angela Chendesh is the Air Resources Supervisor at the California Air and Resources Board. She says the problem is many of these ships are too old and don't have the infrastructure to connect to a power grid. We do see it as, as a very good alternative. Today, Mike and his team are helping a vessel whose electrical outlet is too far to reach. A massive bendable arm is deployed from the barge and hovers over the ship. An engineer then connects it to the smokestack like a giant range hood. Within seconds, the black smoke is gone. We get to see in very clear terms the smoke going away from being distributed out into the air and being captured into these systems. So uh, it's, it's a really, you know, almost instant gratification. Sailing towards a sustainable future while trying to keep our planet on course. Itai Hot, CBS News, Bay Area. Anything to keep a pollution at a reduction is a good idea. All right, coming into the newsroom right now, Israel's military is warning residents of Gaza's largest city to evacuate amid an intensified assault through the territory. We're going to get the latest from the region. You're streaming CBS News 24-7. Happening right now, the Israeli military is warning residents of Gaza to evacuate as its assault on the region intensifies. Leaflets were dropped over the territory, describing a, quote, dangerous combat zone. 
CBS News senior foreign correspondent Holly Williams is joining me now from Tel Aviv. Uh, so Holly, give us an update. What are you hearing about uh, what is happening in Gaza as Israel begins to ramp up this offensive? Good morning, Vlad. Yeah, look, an Israeli airstrike last night on a school that was sheltering displaced Palestinians killed at least 25 people. That is according to an Associated Press reporter who counted the bodies. A hospital official later told CBS News that the death toll had risen to 29, and we understand that that includes several children. In a statement, Israel's military said that it used a, quote, precise munition to target a militant who was involved in the October 7th attack attacks and the military says that it is reviewing the incident. Meanwhile, with a new assault in Gaza City in the northern Gaza Strip, Israel's military has called for yet another mass evacuation of Palestinians. Some people in the Gaza Strip have now been forced to flee four or even five times. The United Nations called the latest exodus, quote, dangerously chaotic, with doctors and nurses at two hospitals rushing to move their patients out of harm's way. Now, Israel's military says that medical facilities do not need to move, but its raids at other hospitals have left medical staff fearful. Meanwhile, a Hamas leader said that the new assault could, quote, reset the negotiation process back to square one. Despite all of that, the CIA director, William Burns, is here in the Middle East this week to restart negotiations for a ceasefire and hostage deal, a deal that so far has proven to be elusive. And finally, the peer built by the U.S. military in Gaza to bring in humanitarian aid, which has been plagued with weather problems, will likely be re-established this week to bring in some additional aid, but could then be permanently dismantled, according to U.S. officials. Vlad. Holly, let me ask you about uh, sentiment in Israel itself. Uh, I know you reported earlier this week that some 60 percent of the population wants a ceasefire put into place. Clearly, all Israelis want the hostages to come home. But what are you hearing about the government, Netanyahu's uh, plans to at least engage in those ceasefire talks with Hamas and, in, and as the United States, with the United States as a mediator? You know, it's really interesting. On one hand, you have the, that polling that you just mentioned, uh, roughly 60 percent of Israelis wanting or in favor of this ceasefire plan outlined by President Biden. We had some reporting uh, in The New York Times last week that some of Israel's top generals want a ceasefire, uh, you know, even if it means leaving Hamas in power in the Gaza Strip. And we know that Israel's most important ally, the U.S., you know, is urging Israel uh, to negotiate uh, a truce. But on the other hand, you know, you have this surge of optimism that there could be a new ceasefire deal last week. But then we hear from Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, saying, well, you know, any deal we do has to leave the door open to us resuming fighting uh, to achieve our objectives. And that's really cooled optimism that a ceasefire deal uh, can be achieved. All right, Holly Williams. There's hoping those hostages come home and that there's finally some peace in the region. I know people are suffering immensely. Appreciate your reporting as always, Holly. Thank you. Okay, staying overseas now in northern India, a double-decker bus collided with a milk truck, killing at least 18 people. Police say 19 people were injured in the crash. Those folks were rushed to a hospital by villagers in the area. India has some of the highest road death rates in the world, with hundreds of thousands of people killed and injured every year. New York City police have now charged a man in the death of a 31-year-old woman who also is accused and alleged to have left her body wrapped in a sleeping bag. 55-year-old Chad Irish was taken into police custody Monday afternoon. Police found 31-year-old Yasmeen Williams. They found her body after a report of a suspicious package in the neighborhood. She had been shot in the head. Irish is charged with legal concealment of a corpse. He was seen on video leaving the apartment building in a wheelchair, dragging what appeared to be Williams' remains. Sources tell CBS News New York, he has nearly two dozen prior arrests and went to prison twice for assault and for robbery. Okay, it is a busy day, and we are tracking the stories from around the country coming into our newsroom right now. We're going to get the latest on the heat forecast, and we're also watching for updates from Alec Baldwin's trial in New Mexico. Stick around. You're streaming CBS News 24-7.
All right, folks, we've been talking a lot about presidential politics. Of course, President Biden is in the midst of hosting a three-day NATO summit event while continuing to combat concerns about whether or not he is fit to serve another four years. Meanwhile, former President Trump made his first appearance in nearly two weeks at a campaign rally at his golf club in the suburbs of Miami. CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarlane is joining me now from the Hill. Uh, Scott, the president has lost some support since yesterday. I know going back to July 2nd, Lloyd Doggett became the first House member to say that President Biden should step down. Uh, we saw Mickey Sherrill, Mikey Sherrill yesterday of New Jersey. What more are you learning? There's this huge group, Vlad, of undeclared, not undecided, but undeclared House Democrats and Senate Democrats about the president's future. And it's a matter of whether they declare themselves today or tomorrow or keep their powder dry in perpetuity. So many U.S. senators seem synchronized on this message that they want to see more and hear more. Those House Democrats have all been declarative, saying the president should withdraw from the race and a new candidate should emerge. But the focus has shifted here, Vlad, to what about those dozens of other swing state, swing district House members who've said nothing, from Virginia through New Jersey to Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona, and Nevada. The pressure is growing for them to take a position because here's the bottom line, Vlad. Back home, they're hearing it from constituents, one way or the other, and they're also facing the prospect of campaign challenges because of their stance or lack of stance on President Biden. I can tell you, my sources with Republican congressional campaign committees say they're going to try to focus attention of voters on what Democrats say or don't say about President Biden. Hmm. Scott, so that's a temperature read of what's going on in the House. What about over in the Senate? That's where... There's a bit more unison, Vlad. There was a cohesive message that emerged from the Senate Democratic Caucus lunch yesterday. So many of them said in so many words it was a constructive meeting and that there's more to see or more to hear in the days ahead. They really have preserved this ability to speak with something of a singular voice if they try to nudge the president in one direction or the other. The president's top surrogates in the Senate have been emphatic with their support his fellow Delaware lawmaker, Chris Coons, Pennsylvania's John Fetterman. But the large majority of Senate Democrats have kept their powder dry, which does give them the capacity to do something as one group later this week or later this month. A lot of attention, Vlad, is shifting to tomorrow's presidential news conference. Maybe more reaction after the president performs in a way at that news conference. Mm. Yeah, uh, all eyes on that press conference tomorrow. Scott, let me ask you about uh, some of the criticism that the Biden administration re re uh, received from, from constituents, from members of Congress, that in the wake of that disastrous debate, that he did not reach out to them sooner. You had an instance, for example, of Jerry Nadler, who's a high-profile uh, House Democrat, uh, who seemed to be suggesting that the president should step aside, and now he seems to have come back. Is that because of that outreach that the president subsequently made? And the president has done direct outreach to dozens of members of Congress, according to our latest reporting. He hasn't called everybody, though that's not really a tenable idea. It's a pretty big Congress. Um, I think there is a, to put it mildly, significant concern about the down-ballot impacts of a softening of the president's polls and standing. There are House seats that are in play. There is always the potential or the hope from House Democrats they could win the majority. There are critical Senate battleground races, all of which could feel a contagion and impact from all this. Those members are among those most expressly issuing their concerns or those who have yet to make a public pronouncement. Yeah, I mean, we've seen Michael Bennett saying that everybody could go down if the president mistakes what we're seeing in his softening poll numbers, uh, not just nationally, but in some of those battleground states, Scott. And I think you got to look at what constitutes a battleground state now. Um, there are concerns about the impact on congressional races in states like New York and New Jersey, Minnesota and Virginia, not the traditional battlegrounds and not electoral college relevant, but important for majorities in the House and Senate. And Vlad, I think you should know where some of these voices calling for the president to withdraw are coming from. It includes New York and New Jersey. Wow, very interesting. All right, Scott McFarlane for us on the Hill. Scott, thanks for racing to the camera for us. We appreciate it as always, my friend. Thank you.
Okay, we've got live pictures coming in from Houston showing the aftermath of Hurricane Barrel. Millions of Texans are still suffering without power as heat indexes could hit above 100 degrees. We're going to continue to follow the relief efforts there. Uh, let's bring in CBS News Philadelphia meteorologist Tammy Sousa with one last look at the blistering heat wave and the national forecast. Tammy, uh, over to you. You know what? This heat wave, it is going to be uh, just continuing on into new, uh, next week. This is going to be unrelenting. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of those uh, numbers uh, right now nationwide. I'm going to focus primarily on the uh, left coast, on the west coast, because some of the highs are going to be in the triple digits. And, and when you get up into places like Montana and you have triple digits that are popping up and you have them all throughout the Intermountain West, you know that it is going to be a very rough stretch. Well, guess what? All of this is going to start moving eastward. So all of those kind folks that are in uh, parts of, oh, say, Houston, that are trying to recover from all of that, they are going to have some trouble. They're not going to get much relief at all coming their way. Let's go ahead and take a look at the big picture because this kind of shows you what's going on. We have the heat alerts on the eastern seaboard, the tip of Florida, and of course, right around the Houston area. But it is this big batch that is out to the west that I am most concerned about because that is going to be moving in our direction and then that's going to hit the East Coast by the time we get into next week. Triple digit temperatures out west this week, possibly on the East Coast next week. Vlad? All right, Tammy Sousa for us. Tammy, thank you. Appreciate you. All right, folks, let's talk about football. I'm talking about what we call soccer in the United States, but the entire planet calls football. Two soccer tournaments, the Copa America and the Euro 2024, are in their final stages. Lionel Messi scored his 109th goal, 109th goal for Argentina last night in the Copa America semifinal against Canada. Only Cristiano Ronaldo has more with 130. Argentina beat Canada. They will now play in the final on Sunday, chasing their second straight title. Over in Europe, the European Championship, get this, 16-year-old phenom, Spanish soccer, Lamine Yamal became the youngest player ever to score at a goal at the Euros. Yamal scored in the 21st minute of Spain's 2-1 win over France yesterday. He turns 17 this Saturday ahead of the final. The record was held by legendary footballer Pele. Uh, for, they will play the winner of England and the Netherlands, which kicks off today. I'm cheering for the Netherlands. <laughs> this is CBS News 24-7. Of course, we're monitoring Alec Baldwin's rush trial. We're going to bring you developments uh, as that trial begins. This is CBS News 24-7.